Good morning. Good morning. And happy Palm Sunday to you. <laughs> We are beginning this holy week and looking towards Easter. Um, before we get going, just a few announcements. First of all, if you are new among us, welcome. We always begin our worship services by saying whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are always welcome here at Bayshore Church. And we're certainly glad that you've joined us today, whether you're here in person or online. And if you are new and would like to know more about the church, we do invite you to fill out one of the welcome cards and the pew racks in front of you. And um, if you didn't get a parking permit and you're parked in the lot, you will want to get one. And hopefully everybody picked up some palm fronds on your way in so you can wave them during our first hymn or any of the hymns, frankly. Yeah. And if you get bored during the sermon, you can fold them into a cross. So. Um, I'm giving you permission if that is some of you've already done it. Look at that overachievers. All right. <laughs> So uh, we do have some special worship opportunities this week, of course. On Thursday evening, we will be having our Maundy Thursday service in the Gabrielson Chapel at 6.30 p.m. It's a relatively simple but meaningful a sermon, uh, a service of scripture and prayer, music, and of course, communion as we remember Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples. So I do invite you to join us for that. On Good Friday, we will have the sanctuary available for personal prayer from noon to three. Um, please feel free to just check in at the office. We'll let you in and you can you can come over at any time during those three hours if you'd like some, some peace and quiet and a chance to offer your own prayers and meditation. And next Sunday, of course, is Easter, and we have two services at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. So if you show up at 9.30, you're really early for the second service and a little late for the first one. So 9 and 10.30, if you want to make it a double feature, hey, join us. Many of us do, <laughs> those, those of us who are participating in the service. So please do join us for that. It, of course, is always a joyful morning with special music by our chancel choir and bells and a brass quartet and timpani and a joyous special morning, of course. Um, today, in addition to celebrating Palm Sunday, we are also celebrating Music Appreciation Sunday because we have such an amazing group of musicians who dedicate their time week after week to enhance our music, um, enhance our worship services with their musical offerings. So um, they're not all in here because they're ready to walk in for our big Palm Processional. But if we could give a warm Bayshore round of applause for our Bayshore Bells, Chancel Choir, and Children's Choir. <laughs> And of course, for the amazing Jason McNally and Julie Ramsey. <laughs> And Chap Cooper, because you know, those mics are important, especially for our um, both our in-person crowd and our online crowd. So Chap, thanks for all you do to keep us loud and clear. <laughs> And um, she's out in the narthex, but I also want to offer a warm welcome to our new alto section leader, Erin Alford. You'll get a chance to hear her this morning and you'll meet her later. So um, in, in addition to all of that, we do have a, an opportunity to celebrate our musicians today, stick around for some time of fellowship. Instead of donuts, we have cake today. So if you're not the donut person and you're a cake person, today's your day. So please do stick around. Um, and finally, Operation Easter Basket is underway over in our youth center. Some of you are aware of that program that Justin Rudd coordinates every year to give out thousands, like thousands of Easter baskets into our community for kids in need. And I suspect it's not too late to pop in and volunteer, even if you didn't get a chance to sign up. Uh, is that right, Justin? All right, and I know it's not too late to donate online if you weren't able to um, participate or, or bring a basket and you'd like to contribute to the cause. It's a wonderful program, and thank you, Justin, to, all, to you and all of your volunteers for making that happen every year. We appreciate it. And I believe that's enough announcements. So at this time, as a people of peace, we are called to share the peace of Christ with one another. So I invite you to rise as you're able and do so.
different this morning having you uh, seated at, at this time during the call to worship. And uh, Julie will tell us when to stand up in a little bit. Um, so let us uh, uh, do the call to worship. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He brings us joy and hope. He comes to set us free from fear. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. join me in the opening prayer. You show us how to enter each day of our lives, O oh God, with humility and courage. As we worship this day, 
we draw upon your example of Jesus on that humble donkey, and we raise our palm branches with joy. We raise our voices shouting along with your people of every age, Hosanna in the highest. Come and save us this day, O Jesus of Jerusalem. Amen. And please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture lesson for today is from Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, found on page 47 of the New Testament in your pew Bibles, if you would like to follow along. When they were approaching Jerusalem, at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately, as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that's never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May God bless us in the hearing of this story. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord.
And children, we're going to have you stay here, and let's sit on the, the steps here. And if we have any other children that would like to come up and join us for the, the children's moment, uh, you're invited to come up now. And if I could displace you just a little bit and sit down by you. All right. Good morning. All right. I still kind of... How you doing? Good. You look great. You sounded great. What were you singing about? When Jesus arrived in Jerusalem. When Jesus went to Jerusalem. All right, what else happened? And when the people were going crazy. People were going crazy. <laughs> crazy with happiness. Crazy happy. You ever get crazy happy? Yeah. Like what makes you crazy happy? Getting McDonald's? <laughs> yeah, what do you get at McDonald's? Two larger fries. Two large fries. All right, that, their fries are the best. Way better than in and outs don't you yeah. think? Yes, I love in and out Nine years, that's the most controversial thing I've said. <laughs> what were you going to say? Your pets make you crazy happy. Just so happy to have your bunnies. Yeah. What do you makes you crazy happy? Um, uh, teasing my dad. Teasing your dad. Oh. Yeah. That's what they're. For, that's what dads are for. Yes. What makes you crazy happy? I know something that makes me crazy happy. Horses. Horses make you crazy happy too. What? Singing. Singing. Yeah. yeah. So, so these people, as Jesus came into the city, they were crazy, crazy happy. And they were so happy, they shouted something. And what was their word they shouted? Hosanna. Hosanna. That's a great word. Hosanna. What does it mean? You don't know? So some words mean two things. Do you know the word aloha? Yeah. yeah. What does aloha mean? Hello and goodbye. It, it means two things, right? Hosanna means two things. First, it means yay. <laughs> yay. You know, Jesus is coming. They're crazy happy, right? So they're saying yay. Hooray. So that's one of the things it means. The other thing it means is save us. Save us. Like help us. Now, they were all gathered at Jerusalem on those streets because they believed that Jesus could do something to make their lives better, right? So save us. So what kinds of things might Jesus save us from? Well, Jesus can save us from the rain. Oh, okay. To calm the, the seas, if your ship to keep your your ship from tipping over. Okay. Uh, like if someone is chasing you who is bad, or like an army that is much more powerful than you, but they don't obey God, then he can just be like, okay, now you just go to open up the door, and then and then the oh. people who obey God can walk through it, and then and then once they're Yeah, so what she said, because they, they, couldn't, they couldn't hear you, okay? So um, uh, she uh, just described the Exodus story, <laughs> right, with Moses and the sea parting and the people going through and the other army get, getting drowned. And uh, you don't have a lot of armies chasing you, though, right? Just to make sure. Okay, good, good, good. She doesn't have to save you from that. Yes? Okay, so you're saying that if you're being chased by a monster, 
And you pray to Jesus, and Jesus can't handle the monster by himself. He will get another monster to help him. <laughs> That's what you're saying. Okay. I did not think this would go this way when I woke up this morning. <laughs> That's a good answer. I never thought of that. I like that. So some of the other kinds of things that Jesus saves us from are having to be afraid because we, he teaches us about God and that God is with us. Jesus uh, saves us from, from living kind of a bad life. He teaches us how to do good things, right? Like have you ever some of the rules that Jesus gave, is, one of them is called the golden rule. Have you ever heard of that? That's right. Treat others the way you want to be treated. So Jesus taught us helpful things like that and uh, treat others like you want to be treated. He told us to forgive people and to be helpful to people who are in need. And that makes, makes us happy when we're able to help somebody. Yeah. Okay, right. So not everyone there believes in, she's saying, stra strangely, you go to a public school is what you said. Strangely. But that's not strange. But at the school, they have the golden rule there, even though it came from Jesus and they're not supposed to have church stuff at, yeah. Yeah, at school. But see, almost every religion and every people have that idea that you should treat others well, right? And so Jesus does that and... Um, it's a, just a good rule to live by, right? Yeah, yeah. What were yeah, you going to say? One of his rules was love God and love everyone else. Love God and love everyone else and your neighbor. Yeah. Uh, um, and when they always watch Monster Dog, but when we see, see other monsters who are bad, just beat up the whole thing because they will always be see the bad monsters who are bad to help the others. So we're talking about Godzilla. And the, <laughs> and the other monsters that wreck Tokyo. And did you ever see King Kong versus Godzilla? Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah, Jesus is like that. I, I, I don't know how. <laughs> sort of. So Jesus is part, and so people were shouting, Hosanna, it means save us, kind of help us, and we're uh, celebrating all the good things that, that Jesus did. And we can continue to do that all day as we prepare, and uh, next Sunday will be, what, Easter Sunday, the big uh, celebration here at church, and we'll all have fun. So let's have a, a prayer. Let's fold our hands together and uh, close our eyes and bow our heads and repeat after me. Dear God... Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Thank you for Jesus. Today we shout. Today we shout. Hosanna. Hosanna. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up and spending this time. I really enjoyed it. And you look <laughs> great. And so now it's time for uh, Miss, Mrs. Melissa and Sunday School. And the rest of us will stand and sing our hymn. <laughs>
may be seated. I invite you to join with me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, on this Palm Sunday, as we begin Holy Week, we pause to remember Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. As we recall all that transpired there so long ago, may we prayerfully honor and contemplate the meaning of those final days of Jesus' earthly life. And may our hearts be open this day and all days as we listen for your Spirit's message and your call to each of us. Amen. Today, we conclude our Lenten sermon series based on the book Freeing Jesus by Diana Butler Bass, as we consider the idea of Jesus as Savior. Now, this is a common title for Jesus and one that is very familiar and comfortable for some people. And for other people, Savior is a name that is a little more challenging or less comfortable for a variety of reasons. Wherever you may find yourself on that spectrum, I hope that you'll find something beneficial in today's reflection as we ponder this name a little more deeply. Now, the name Savior might be one of the most familiar and popular titles for Jesus in modern Christianity, especially in American Protestantism, but that wasn't always the case historically. Diana Butler Bass points out that in the four Gospels, Jesus is only directly named as Savior a couple of times. First, in the Gospel of Luke, when the angel proclaims the shepherds the, to, the, to the shepherds those familiar words that we hear every year on Christmas Eve. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. And of course, then the shepherds go meet him, right? That's the next movement. They've got to go meet this new savior. And the second gospel reference ought to ring a bell for those of you who are in our Gospel of John study group. In chapter four, after the Samaritan woman encounters Jesus at the well, she shares the good news with her Samaritan community. And after checking out Jesus for themselves, they then tell her this. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. The Samaritan villagers claim this title for Jesus and this good news for themselves. That's it for the gospels. In addition, in the New Testament, there are two uses of the word, or of the name savior, I should say, in the book of Acts, only one in the undisputed letters of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians, 18 in all of the other New Testament letters combined, and zero in Revelation. And that's it. That's not a lot. I was actually sort of surprised by this. Now, other names for Jesus, including Lord, Teacher, Son of God, Son of Man, those are much more popular in the New Testament texts as is Messiah in Hebrew and Christ, of course, in Greek, which both mean anointed one. So it may have taken a while as the Christian tradition developed over time for savior to catch on as a title for Jesus. However, the Hebrew root of the name Jesus itself does mean the Lord saves. So Jesus' very name already expresses God's saving work. And it's clear that Jesus' first followers and the generations of early Christians that would soon follow were concerned with salvation on various levels and had faith in God's power to save. As Mark tells the story on that first Palm Sunday, when Jesus and his disciples staged their march down from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem to the city gates, the people were shouting those words we just heard, they're words from Psalm 118 that were often read and part of the celebration of Passover. Hosanna, save us. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Save us now, they cried out. To God, to Jesus, to both. 
What kind of salvation were they longing for, I wonder? What salvation could and would God bring, and how would Jesus, the anointed one of God, help bring it? I think their call for salvation probably had many layers and dimensions to it. On an individual level, some were probably longing for release from any number of personal struggles, from sickness, from suffering, from grief, from lack of hope. On a communal level, they were also longing for rescue from Roman imperial occupation and from the oppression and exploitation that accompanied it. Probably many of the people who joined the crowd that day were fairly poor, day laborers, working class folks. Some may have been more middle class, merchants and artisans. They were all there in Jerusalem, though, to celebrate the Passover, to remember the story of their ancient ancestors' escape from enslavement and exploitation in Egypt. That was, for them, a central example of God's saving work in the world. And now their own generation was longing for such liberation again, because there was a new pharaoh in town, and his name was Caesar. That processional into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives that day was more than a parade. It was really a protest march of sorts. It was a nonviolent demonstration against Rome and all that it stood for. The reason Jesus rides a colt, a donkey, is because Pilate rode into town on a war horse. That's a contrast right there. Pilate, accompanied by soldiers, legions, Jesus accompanied by a crowd of people, ordinary folks. You know, I think that longing for salvation that the crowd expressed that day in their shouts of Hosanna was very much rooted in this moment and in this life. They longed for the kingdom of God, for God's shalom, for peace, for a just social order. They longed for loving relationship with God and within all creation. I think salvation for them meant deliverance from domination and oppression. Salvation meant liberation from all that enslaves, all that binds, all that prevents true freedom. Salvation meant restoration and renewal of the world. They didn't invent this vision that day, of course. It had been their hope for generations, actually. And salvation meant healing of all that was sick, all that was unwell in this world. You know, healing is actually in the word salvation itself. As Diana Butler Bass points out, like a salve, You've all heard that word, a salve that heals. The Latin root of salvation is salvus, which originally referred to being made whole, uninjured, safe, in good health. Jesus, the Savior, is Jesus, the healer, one who brings health and wholeness. Now, that's certainly a theme that the Gospels proclaim many times over, isn't it? And as we know, one peaceful march into Jerusalem didn't overthrow Rome. I don't think they really expected it to. It probably did bring hope. It probably brought resolve to the people who participated. But it also drew negative attention to Jesus from the Roman authorities and their local collaborators. And when we couple this event with the more direct disruption that he caused in the temple a couple of days later, you remember the bit where he turns over the tables of the money changers, shuts things down, calls it a den of rob robbers, that whole thing? A lot of negative attention came upon Jesus, and he ends up arrested, condemned, and crucified by the end of the week. Crucifixion is one of the horrid things that Rome did to those who they viewed as rabble-rousers and revolutionaries, even nonviolent ones. It was a public, humiliating, and violent execution. 
and they intended it to send a message about who's in charge and what happens to those who question and challenge their power and authority. When we think about this from a historical perspective, the crucifixion of Jesus demonstrates pretty vividly two dramatically and competing paradigms of salvation. The salvation that Rome claimed it could bring on one hand, and the salvation that only God could bring on the other hand. You know, Caesar Augustus was also named by his contemporaries as the savior of the world. A few decades before Jesus was born, Augustus successfully ended many years of civil war and brought the Roman Empire together and, to, and into a relative state of peace. But Roman peace, the Pax Romana, you've probably heard of that before, could only really be maintained through violent means, through conquest, through victory over one's foes, through military control. In other words, Rome would have to keep nailing people to crosses over and over again in a sick cycle of violence in order to stay in power. On the other hand, our resurrecting God refuses to let the cross win. God doesn't let the cross have the last word. And I know I'm getting a week ahead of myself. I can't help it. It's important. The crucifixion of Jesus, God's beloved one, the son of God, the anointed one, all named so, also reminds us that God is always radically and compassionately present and in solidarity with all who suffer victimization of any sort. Jesus's willingness to die at the hands of Rome rather than rise up in violence against Rome can, if we let it, expose the sick cycle of violence of Roman peace or any other such types of institutions for what they really are. In contrast, God's salvation of the world, unlike Rome's, can only be brought about through peace, true peace, can only be expressed in love, can only include liberation for not some, but indeed all creation. Often modern forms of Christianity emphasize the cross as the primary saving moment of Jesus's life and that salvation is primarily personal and comes in the form of forgiveness and eternal life. But I would also encourage us to think much more broadly about our theology of salvation because the emphasis in the gospels is in fact much broader and much more communal in nature. I wanna read a passage from Diana Butler Bass's book in which she writes, all sorts of people in the gospels got saved before Jesus died on the cross. When Jesus healed, they experienced salvus, God's salvation. They followed him. Lives were changed, transformed. Disciples gave up riches and goods that they might inherit eternal life. Tax collectors abandoned their jobs and surrendered their social standings to eat with Jesus. Children, slaves, soldiers, peasants, fishermen, farmers, prisoners, the sick, the blind, the lame. When they encountered Jesus, they found salvation. The wholeness, the healing, the oneness with God that had been the stuff of longing. Every miracle, every act of hospitality, all the bread broken and wine served, everything that Jesus did saved people long before Rome arrested and murdered him. It was all this loving and healing and saving that got him in trouble with the authorities. He was not killed so his death would save people. He was killed because he was already saving them. He threatened a world based in fear one held in the grip of Roman imperialism by providing or by proving that a, com a community could gather in love, could set a table of plenty and live in peace with a compassionate God. 
I believe that God's saving work through Jesus is as much about finding abundant, love-filled life right now as in the future. God's liberating, healing, saving love transforms both individuals and entire communities still. God's saving work of love is still unfolding all around us, and we are called to receive it and to participate in it. God's steadfast love, grace, and faithfulness to all of God's beloved creation is the source of salvation. And Jesus, the one who demonstrated God's love so clearly and so passionately, can and does still liberate us, heal us, meet us with compassion, and save us from hopelessness, from helplessness, from self-centeredness and prejudice, from isolation, from fear, from worrying about the future, and so much more. We experience that throughout our lives in many different ways, both big and small. I don't know what your particular experience is, but I find that Jesus saves me in these ways all the time. <laughs> Salvation is not a one and done deal. Salvation is something that is unfolding always. And it doesn't mean, of course, that everything is suddenly perfect, easy, turns out the way I hoped it would. But it does usually mean that I find the strength, the faith, the support, the hope to carry on, to put one foot in front of the other and keep walking this journey of faith. I've seen it over and over again, and I bet you have too, that God's saving, life-giving, renewing love makes it possible for people to courageously offer their own loving and creative contributions to the world, extending a hand of healing, embodying peace and working for peace in the world, seeking both distributive and restorative justice in our world. God's loving, saving work is still unfolding, and God's people of hope and compassion are doing it. When we do what Jesus did and taught us to do, to love God and our neighbors, fiercely, boldly, bravely, and deeply, we are participating in God's saving work in this world. Here are a few examples. You are participating in God's saving work when you feed those who are hungry in our community. When you make Easter baskets or donate supplies to do so so that kids in our community know that they are loved and supported and cared for. When you offer support to those who are without homes and other necessities. When you show up in compassionate and caring ways for others when they are hurting. When you support others in their struggle for justice, whether it be just working conditions or a safe and welcoming environment, all sorts of things. When you call out and work for peaceful re resolutions to the world's conflicts and strife. Every time we live into Jesus' call to love, we are participating in Jesus' work of healing and liberation. God's saving work may unfold a little more slowly than we'd like sometimes. That's true. It did for Jesus' first followers, too. But it is happening. So have faith. Trust in God. Refuse to give up. Remember that today's worries are enough for today and bear witness to the salvation that God is bringing in our lifetime. Hosanna, praise God, amen.
Let us enter into our time of prayer with a moment of silent prayer. O Divine Presence, whose wondrous love stretches across the universe and whose compassion knows no bounds, we gather in your light on this Palm Sunday, hearts open and spirits yearning for your grace. As we remember the journey of Jesus into Jerusalem, a path paved with hope and heralded by palms, we pray for your saving grace. Save us from the narrow pathways of our thinking where fear and prejudice limit the expanse of our love. Liberate us from the chains of self-centeredness that we may see your face in every stranger and your love in every act of kindness. Save us from the temptation to nurse grudges and resentments. Free us from the bondage of bitterness. Save us from greed and selfishness. Free us to prioritize spiritual wealth over material gain. O source of all, save us from the cynicism that clouds our perspective, from the despair that threatens our springs of hope. As the palm branches once spread before Jesus, spread your light before us, guiding us to paths of justice and peace. Renew within us a spirit of humility and grace. May we learn from Jesus' journey as a testament to serving and loving the least of these. And so we pray for those who are in hardship, for those who are ill, for those who are recovering. We pray for children seeking salvation from their imaginary monsters and for the children whose monsters are all too real. Teach us to hold fast to what is good, to seek joy even in the places of hardship and to embody your love in every word and deed. May our hosannas remind us that we too are called to lay down our lives in love and service. May we strive to live in a way that brings your kingdom closer, a realm where love conquers hate, peace overcomes violence, and where all are welcomed and cherished. In the name of Jesus, who shows us the way, as he taught us, so now we pray all together. Our God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us from sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our gifts today are more than a financial transaction. They are a symbolic act of laying down our palm branches at the feet of Jesus. They are our hosannas, cried out in a modern context, asking Jesus to save us and use us in the work of salvation and healing for the world. So let us give generously as we have received so that the work of love and justice can flourish in our community and beyond.
Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Gracious God, receive these gifts as an expression of our joy and gratitude. Take our voices and our offerings and use them to proclaim your salvation to all people. Amen. As we now move into this holy week, may you go forth to be the hands of God's saving and healing love in this world. And as you go, may you trust in God's love to uphold you, in the peace of Christ to sustain you, and the power of the Holy Spirit to inspire you, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>